Welcome to Music Is My Life, a brand new podcast presented by Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. Thank you for joining us as we follow the musical paths of our subjects from the very first time they make contact with their instruments of choice to their current status, which ordinarily involves music every day of their lives. Today's subject, Glenn Kochi. You probably know him from his day job as Wilco's drummer. He's also a composer in his own right, and we caught up with him before a recent solo show in Boston. So before Glenn Kochi walks you through his musical life, let's review some statistics. In 2001, Kochi replaced Ken Coomer as Wilco's drummer. Before that, he had worked with Wilco leader Jeff Tweedy and producer Jim O'Rourke in a project they called Loose Fur. Not Lucifer, but Loose Fur. Oh, I love a good pun. Now, if you heard me say who Kochi plays drums for and you said to yourself, Harumph! Wilco Schmilko! You are either A, very rude and dismissive and you use outdated language to express that, or B, you are quite aware that Wilco have a brand new album coming out on September 9th called Wilco Schmilko. It's their 10th official studio album, their 7th with Kochi behind the kit. But before he got involved in any of that Wilco Schmilko business, Kochi studied music at the University of Kentucky, and before that, he was a member of the drum line in his high school marching band in Roselle, Illinois. But Glenn Kochi's musical life began way before that. I've identified myself as a drummer since age three, when I when I destroyed my first drum, uh, and I started I started uh, taking lessons when I was ten years old. When I first started out, honestly, my first big influence was uh, besides the marching the high school marching band that would practice near my house and march up and down the streets, Gene Krupa. Um, my family would take uh, vacations to a, a place in Wisconsin a lot and drive from Chicago. And there were these rest stops or, or truck stops that had old Gene Krupa cassettes. And so, you know, he's the, he's the, the kind of the father of the drum solo. He, he kind of popularized in Sing 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 with Betty Good, Benny Goodman Orchestra, um, the drum solo. Uh, and he, I, I listened to that a lot. But then, of course, from there, having I'm the, I have five older siblings, so I was hearing a lot of Beatles. I was hearing, you know, uh, Elton John, whatever was on the radio at that time, Glenn Campbell. Uh, so a lot of different drummers that way. And then, you know, quickly after that, got into Bonham and uh, Black Sabbath, and you know, more metal drummers. And then throughout high school, it was the '80s. So it was, of course. Neil Peart with Rush and Stuart Copeland and, you know, then Living Color and, of course, a whole world of jazz drummers in college uh, and after college, a whole, a whole world of lesser known drummers. Kochi says his time studying music at school opened his ears and it also opened some doors. Earning a degree in music performance and classical percussion was essential to get him to where he is now, even if he may be the only member of Wilco who is able to read music. So when I think back about my music education and having been a product of, of school programs from an early age, marching band, orchestra, and junior high, but also starting my first rock band when I was about 10. So I've always kind of been in rock bands, done that, but I also have a degree in, in classical percussion and have uh, always played in, in more academic settings as well. For me, it's been tremendously useful, especially for what I do now. And, you know, I think it kind of dictated what I do now. Um, my whole approach to drum set is dictated by all the different areas of percussion I learned because percussion, unlike most traditional instruments, is not an instrument. It's, it's a world of, of, of instruments and there's so many different ways you can go, uh, so many different styles you, that go with certain instruments, so many different things you study. You know, in college I was studying four mallet classical marimba. I was studying orchestral and, and timpani parts for opera. I was also studying African drumming and steel drum band drumming, uh, playing big band and jazz, um, you know, studying like ragtime drumming, all, you know, you name it, multiple percussion, uh, 20th century literature. So all over the place, you learn all these things and that's what informed my approach to drum set now because when I got out of college I was like well let's see I'm not 
the best big band jazz drummer, but I love playing rock, but I'm also, you know, I know I don't want to be in an orchestra anymore. So I just took all those areas that I studied and started using those techniques, those instruments, that, that the concepts that, you know, it's not just about rhythm and groove, which a lot of drum set playing is, but it's also about timbre and texture. And I can play mallet melodic percussion i can play electronic percussion i can do little uh, flourishes and swells or i can just lay down grooves and bash too so there's all these things when i started applying all those uh, lessons and ideas and concepts and incorporating the instruments that i learned in these other areas of percussion to drum set that's when i started to get my own voice and that's when i you know got the piqued the interest of jim o'rourke and jeff and you know that's Pretty much why I was asked to join Wilco because Wilco at that point was going in a different direction uh, leading up to recording Yankee Hotel Foxtrot and I was doing a lot of free improvising um, using guitar effects and contact mics and playing no rhythm at all and it seemed like the right kind of sound world that was appropriate for that record at least. So for me that's been incredibly useful and I always encourage when I teach and when I did teach a lot I always encourage students to learn how to read because for me, it's just uh, it's a tremendous tool. If I hear a groove, I can picture it, and and you ask me ten minutes later, I can play it. Where you know, I know some people who can't do that. They have to like listen to it right away and play it at the same time. Or I just think it's been a great tool for me. And also now that I a lot of what I do is composing for um, you know chamber groups, orchestra, uh, percussion ensembles, things like that. So obviously, it's it's key in that as well. Um, it's not that crucial to a lot of people. I know many amazing musicians, incredibly creative artists, and just guys who have mastery over their instruments um, who don't read at all and never studied and are self-taught. And that's great too, because they a lot of times have a certain type of musical personality that is truly original, um, that is their own voice. But like I said, I'm very studied and I feel like I've gotten to that point from a different channel as well. So I don't think, uh, by studying, by learning things that are having teachers, that you're necessarily going to be a carbon copy of what you've learned. I think those are just more tools to find out who you are. Um, both methods work. I just encourage people, especially younger people now, because of the I see the the reality. I work with a lot of young percussionists, a lot of young musicians, and the reality of the world. It's just like if you have those skills, um, you're going to be more marketable. You're going to have more opportunities that you can accept and that you can fulfill and, and knock out of the park. Uh, so, I mean, it's been great for me, but uh, yeah, I cherish my, my background in education, but it's not for everyone, I understand that. Kochi says what he looks for in a collaborator isn't even necessarily musical virtuosity. When it comes to collaborators, I just look, I think I look mostly for um, a kind of creativity, I guess, uh, a curiosity, a hunger to, to keep growing, and creativity like it doesn't matter if they're great on their instrument uh, but if they're coming up with interesting ideas those are the people i want to play with uh, or write for um, i think that's the most key element because i've seen plenty of shredders and i know that that's a you know an amazing thing i love that i watch it you know i i indulge sometimes myself but uh it's it's that doing something that's not been done before that's what excites me and that's what excites me about literature about art visual art about theater about dance that's the stuff that really gets me like how did they think about food chefs how did you come up with this thing when people have been doing this dish for 300 years and all of a sudden you found a new way to do it it's the same way uh with music for me it's like that's what i i geek out on so i think i'm more of a, a creative nut than i am even a, a music nut and those are the people I, I try and seek out professionally. One of the first drummers that Kochi encountered professionally after college was Maureen Tucker of the Velvet Underground. And you're not likely to find a better example of an instrumentalist known less for virtuosity than for, well, simplicity. Brilliant simplicity, really. I was lucky enough right after I finished college to play in a record produced by Maureen Tucker from the Velvet Underground and got to double drum with her. And it was a perfect experience for putting all of this stuff I learned in college in perspective because she is someone who is completely unschooled, uh, but yet 
play is kind of note perfect on all those Velvet Underground recordings. You know, sometimes it's drums, sometimes she's just playing a tambourine on two and four. Um, and so that was a great lesson to, oh yeah, keep it all in check. Um, think about the music and the big picture first, not just about, you know, what you can add. Uh, um, so my drum, my influence have, have, you know, constantly fluctuated. And if I told you them, this would be 15 minutes of me spouting off names. Uh, and, you know, a lot of non-drummer and non-musical influences as well. Right. Ideas, people, you know, a lot of visual art really influences a lot of what I try and like imitate. How did they do that? And how would I apply that to what I do? So it's just a lot of that, asking that question when I see something really cool, finding out how they made that leap and then how do I apply it to what I do somehow. Kochi does indeed apply several leaps to his drumming. One look at his kit and you might find a radiator, some hubcaps, faucets, uh, some spindly looking thing that I couldn't figure out what it was and I had to ask him about. Oh, the, that, that's a fruit basket. Okay. It was a wedding present. Yeah. Was it yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. So it sounds me. like shit unless you hang it from a rubber band over a contact mic, but... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, the cool thing about percussion is it does encapsulate everything that's not a, a woodwind, a brass, or string instrument, or voice, right? So you have those very defined things, and percussion is everything else, at least in my definition of it. Um, traditionally, in the orchestra, that's what it was when they were like, okay, this composer wrote for cannons, this one wrote for church bells, this one wrote for starter pistol or wind machines. Who's going to play it? Give it to the percussion section. And then... People like John Cage completely, you know, liberated percussion as well because now uh, it was just as much about exploring musical ideas that weren't based on harmony and melody. Um, and so you, he incorporated break drums and tin cans. Um, and, you know, this is almost, well, yeah, 80 years ago. So, uh, you know, pretty groundbreaking stuff. And since then, I think drummers are kind of used to like, oh yeah, these are things we have in the percussion studio at any conservatory or college uh, that anything is, uh, is viable as an instrument. And so I'm so ridiculous and bad about it. My wife has an incredible tolerance, but I can kind of look at something now and know, I know materials enough to know what kind of sound it's gonna produce. But yeah, it's incessant my whole life tapping on things. Uh, checking out the sound, what it is. So I, I, I've explored a lot of things like that. You know, there's, on I'm Trying to Break Your Heart by Wilco. I, I use on that tune alone, uh, uh, old metal hubcap uh, with a contact mic on it as well. That's run through a little overdriven amp to get a different sound. Um, I use ceramic tiles that I play with rubber mallets, with marimba mallets. Um, I use uh, drink mixers uh, on the insides of pianos, and, and sometimes I tie fishing line and put little washers so it gets it's a very fast-moving mallet. Um, it's a nice collage. Yeah. And that's, you know, Jim O'Rourke makes that song. He brought out all the elements and made it, because it's three chords, like seven minutes or whatever, he made all these scene changes that gave it, gave it a narrative until you get to that end. There's there's a lot of a lot of cool sounds on that, but also um, you know with my own uh, music as well. Like on, on my kit that I'm playing tonight, I have a fruit basket that was a wedding present that actually doesn't sound that great. But because I incorporate contact mics a lot, um, you get these small sounds that can compete with big sounds, and sometimes you bring out uh, aspects of the sounds personality that otherwise get lost if you're just listening you know, with your ear. So this fruit basket sounds bad, but if you want to hang it from, a, suspend it from a rubber, a rubber band so it can ring, put that over the contact mic, you get this fundamental low sound that's incredible. Same thing with my prepared snare, which is just a riff on John Cage's prepared piano. I've got springs, large springs that I scrape with my fingernails, small springs that I swipe. I've got fishing line uh, with wrapped around uh, little sticks with a uh, violin bow rosin that gets a creaking noise and uh, there's a play on a kawika, there's a stick coming through and lines roar, these little wires. Uh, if you put beeswax on them, you get the friction. And so the drums are resonator too, uh, not, just, not just something that you strike. So those little sounds then can compete with the big sounds. And so by using effects pedals that guitarists always do, but you know, drummers uh, can too. Um, and using contact mics, you even explode that sound world more. And, you know, tonight I'll use an air raid sign, siren. I'll use a little kind of Buddha balls. I'll use bird calls. 
um, besides normal percussion and classical percussion, the crotales, the glockenspiel, um, drum cymbals, uh, yeah, so alm glocken, Swiss cowbells, cricket boxes. What else do I have up there tonight? Yeah, little shakers from bottle caps and all sorts of fun stuff. But uh, yeah, I think all percussionists now are, especially classically trained ones, are required to to kind of explore different sound worlds for a lot of the, the literature they have to play. And also any drummer who's recorded in the studio, you know, I have a, a lot of variations on sticks and mallets that I, uh, you know, tape coins on or tape up or put towels over just to get different sounds because under a close microphone, you can get a really compelling sound that maybe if you just used a stick or just used a brush or a rod, you wouldn't get. When Kochi joined Wilco, they were in the process of birthing their fourth album and experiencing some labor pains, frankly. The album was a departure from everything they'd done before. They began as kind of an alt-country group, then went into more of a synthy rock sound with their third album, Summer Teeth. So I asked Kochi if it was difficult to come into this role as the new drummer at the time, when the style of his predecessor was so different from his own. Well, it's interesting uh, joining a band that already has had a few records out at that point and, uh, you know, history with a with a drummer that I really respect and, and enjoy is playing a lot. Um, I kind of took the attitude of with Wilco, at least, um, you know, if it's if it's not broken, don't fix it. And knowing those songs, I was attached to some of those parts already. Um, so I basically tried to keep those parts intact. However, I think anyone uh, you know, playing someone else's music, you naturally interpret it through your own background, your own history. Um, and so I think some of those parts, you know, sound like me, even if I'm playing what Ken did, or, you know, in a couple isolated instances, what Jay did. Um, and over time, like any songs, even ones I've recorded live, they tend to mutate over a period of time. And you know, there's, there's songs that we've played hundreds of times that right now there is a way that we know the song but it's not really what it was at the record. Fills are different, things that we do are different, uh, tempos are different, energy, there's a lot of things that can morph over time and you find something that works and then it's like, oh, you get locked into that and keep doing it over and over. So that's happened naturally even with, with the songs that I originally recorded. Of course, it's happened with the songs I didn't record. So uh, I guess the, the core of, of those parts is still there, but it's filtered through my personality and more than that, through, through time. So how does a drummer who is so experimental and so interested in finding new percussive sounds to incorporate into his music, how does somebody like that fit into a rock band? How does he stay satisfied just playing a straight up four on the floor beat? Everything in life is about balance. You know, work, family, being in a rock band or being a solitary composer, uh, performing experimental off the wall music or just laying down a groove. I kind of need all of that in my life to be happy. And I enjoy just as much as, you know, exploring all those sounds and coming up with new pieces that they fit into, um, just laying down a deep groove. And I tend to, uh, you know, because a lot of the most successful drum set players and studio drummers throughout history are the guys who don't add a bunch of stuff, don't throw a bunch of notes in. Um, they don't they're not trying to always show you what they can do and display their facility on the instrument. Instead, they're just, you always hear that term, serving the song. Well, serving the song is complex. I'm not gonna go off on a tangent of that because a lot of times you wanna take a song to a place that can elevate it and take it to a, a different place than what you'd expect to hear. Um, but as far as just playing simple, I get off on that, not just by the feel and how good it feels to play it, but also, uh, playing some songs that I just do a backbeat, simple basic beat with Wilco that I'll play a few hundred times over the course of, you know, years. I, I just zone in on the minutia of it. Um, so for me, that could be like, okay, instead of playing the hi-hat up and down like this, what if I play German instead of French grip? What if I swing it? And when I swing it, if it sounds a little bit different, it feels different if I, if I put the pressure on my fulcrum up here or if I loosen my fulcrum and and squeeze from my back fingers and I get more of the weight of my arm. And then with well, how much tip and how much neck am I using on the hi-hat? And there's, you know, a thousand different 
parameters of what makes the sound and what makes this feel a certain way just on that one limb. Besides what's happening on your bass drum, am I bearing it, playing out, heel up, heel down, the snare drum, what kind of technique, where am I hitting it? What, you know, am I lifting from the back of the stick or the front of the stick? So many things that I can zone in on and just explore that way too, you know, while I'm serving the song and staying out of the way of the lyrics or trying to help illustrate the lyrics or just providing the anchor, which some songs, that's all you need as a drummer. Um, and so that's, I guess I'm just, it's a different type of exploration, but that makes it very easy for me to not mess that up and just see what is going into this to make it right. When he's not busy serving the song for Wilco, Kochi works on solo projects. He's released four albums under his own name. While he says he doesn't actively engage in any marketing for the music, he lets the music do its own marketing. I mean, the only thing I would have to say about any sort of marketing anyway would be um, I don't really know anything about it. What's always worked for me is uh, doing what I found interesting. And honestly, my solo records are not money makers for me, but they not directly, not by royalties, but they've almost acted as a sort of uh, business card. And, you know, when I released uh, Mobile on uh, Nonesuch back in 2006, after I released that, I got commissioned by Kronos Quartet and by Silk Road Ensemble and by Bang on a Can and Eighth Blackbird and So Percussion. And so because of that, I had all this other work and that's kind of why I document a lot of my music through recordings is because that's kind of my avenue for marketing. Um, yeah, that's th that's my business card. Yeah. Is making music and letting people hear it. And if they like it, maybe it leads to other things or other collaborations. Kochi's parting words of advice. Keep practicing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you enjoy. Keep being you. Keep learning. Because you never know when your chance is going to come. Everyone usually has some sort of chance. Uh, you just got to be ready when it is. And yeah. it might be tomorrow, it might be in 20 years. But, uh, I mean, that's what happened for me at least. I was doing something at the right time and the right person saw it and that led to this or that or that. Or, you know, it happened a couple times and it all took off from there. May it all someday take off from there for you. Thank you very much for listening. This has been... Music is my life.